Man, you come straight out of a cone. Yo, yo, what up, what up? It is Saturday, you know what time it is, that means we are here, and welcome to another episode of Straight Out of a Comic Book. I am your host, Will Farrow, and we got some things to talk about today. We got some movie news, we got some TV news as well uh, that we're going to be starting off with, so uh, thank y'all for joining us here on this Saturday morning. Uh, nine o'clock where I'm at on the uh, Pacific Coast, wherever y'all at, different time zones. Not gonna start naming specific ones because we'll be here all day. But um, we got some things to talk about today. Um, some season finales, some new news going on in the movies, and then of course addressing something that has been sweeping the internet lately, which is this. Nemo theory. We're gonna get into that and we also gonna get into another opinion that I was asked in my DMs this week that we're gonna address here on straight out of a comic book. Shout out to everybody that's watching, such as folks like King Mike Hall. What up to you over there on YouTube? So we're gonna go ahead and get started with the first bit of news. And the first bit of news we are going to start off with is in the movies all right in the Le movie era and of course we're talking about the new beetlejuice 2 trailer that just dropped a full trailer uh dropped this week for beetlejuice i'm excited about it man beetlejuice is one of my favorite films as well as my one of my favorite cartoon series such a dope character such a dope story and um i'm just glad to see that they are picking up on this movie year tw- over 20 years later just catching up to see exactly what is going on with them uh and the trailer revealed a lot if you haven't seen the trailer go check it out i won't fully play it here just you know for those Oh, copywriting reasons and everything like that. But um, it did give us a little bit more detail into what is going on. Of course, a majority, uh, not a majority, but of course, some of the original characters like uh, Captain O'Hara's character, Winona Ryder, as well as Michael Keaton reprising his role as Beetlejuice is seen in the in the trailer, as well as some of the new ones coming on, which is, of course, our favorite Jenna Ortega playing Lydia. Dietz's um, daughter I forget her name I know I think it's 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 Abitha or some stuff like this starts with an A very artistic very different um, as well as J- uh, Justin Th- uh, Tho I can't remember I don't know how to pronounce his last name and so I'm not going to butcher it but he uh, was also in Charlie's Angels 2 uh, and he is here I believe he is playing Lydia Dietz's husband in this film, I believe that uh, she is, she, of course, she is married um, and, and has a kid. So that makes obvious of sense what's going on to uh, Laura Aloha as well as Tori Griffin over there on YouTube. Thank y'all so much for joining us. We are talking we're talking about the new Beetlejuice trailer dropping. And um, Astrid is Jenna Ortega's name. Astrid uh, in the movie. And we got again, we got a little bit more information on what's on slightly a little bit more of what's going on in this sequel now we do start off with as we saw in the teaser uh the Dietzes have returned to wish off Astrid's grandfather um who has passed in the film which is a who was uh, the dad that originally played uh, Lydia's dad who was played originally by Jeffrey Jones um wasn't sure why Jeffrey Jones wasn't in the film he is still alive but um I did notice that he hasn't really done anything since 2016 um and I think what well, well uh, 2019 cuz he I think he had a feature in the Deadwood movie uh, the show from HBO where they actually uh, they made an entire film of it and that was in 2019 and so we haven't really seen him in anything or, or, or anything so not sure why he didn't reprise the role if you don't know who Jeffrey Jones is um, he is also the principal from Ferris Bueller if I have any millennials watching Ferris Bueller is a 80s film a bot a a uh, white kid that is in a suburb who just decided he is not going to go to school. Doesn't seem that special to y'all because if you don't feel like going, you just don't go. But back then, 
skipping school was a big thing and your teachers actually cared rather than just sending the police to you. So if you don't know about the movie, go check out the movie Ferris Bueller. It is a eighties cult classic and I just showed my age and I don't care because we had some fantastic mu uh, movies. Shout out to the gamer assassin. Also joining lower, uh, Laura Aloha said, I wish they made a movie about how he became Beetlejuice. I also agree. Uh, uh, Laura. And, and I feel like maybe we might get that with this resurgence of the sequel. I could see them continuing to expand the universe of Beetlejuice so I could also see them maybe giving them a sequel uh, or giving them a prequel, maybe even a TV show about him becoming Beetlejuice. Because what it seems now more, um, what, what kind of um, really made me think a little bit was what Lydia referred to him as in the trailer at, uh, when she was talking to Astrid. Because like we said, it picks up where Lydia's father has passed away. They've come back to the old house in the original movie. And of course, Astrid is looking around, learning things about her father. And then she finds this flyer that uh, is, a that you know, the Beetlejuice flyer. And so it is something when Lydia tells her about Beetlejuice, she refers to him as a demon. Now, that was very funny to me because usually, you know, we think of him as like a poltergeist or a ghost. We never really thought of Beetlejuice as a demon. So that also brings another interesting layer to Beetlejuice. And also, too, if that is the case, was he assigned to be this being of chaos or to bring disruption onto the different plane of the living, it opens up a whole new can of worms for Beetlejuice, which is why I agree to Laura that uh, uh, it starts to make you ask those questions of, well, who was Beetlejuice before he became Beetlejuice? Because we doubt that that was his name when he was alive. Like, I, I doubt somebody was going around, I can't wait. Uh, my my bow, my love of my life, Beetlejuice is taking me to dinner. Like, no, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and I also agree with Tori Griffin that the uh, um, that they did also show that in the cartoon. But, and I agree, but it wasn't enough. It showed just a little bit to where it's like, okay, I but I want to see the real detail behind it. Because it was kind of very cartoonish as to how they said he became Beetlejuice. I want to know the real story, especially with this type of tone. Um, shout out to you, Shawnee, as well. Eight six nine. She said, "Hey, Will, I'm the same. I'd love a prequel for Beetlejuice, a demon that got stuck on a board game." Yes. So, and again, too, to that point, Shawnee, that is also was mentioned in the trailer. How did that happen? Who cursed Beetlejuice? To where you have to say his name three times in order to summon him. So who was the one that put that curse on him? Because it seems like that binds him. And then also, what did he do to be given that type of punishment? That's why I also agree that I think a prequel would be something very great to see. And as we move forward into the trailer, we started to see a lot more of what's going on on the other side. And it seems like Astrid may have been kidnapped by somebody over on the um uh, the suit on the uh you know the astral plane of the dead in limbo uh it seems like somebody has taken her and it's not beetlejuice so that also got very interesting or maybe beetlejuice sold her to somebody to clear his debt um not really sure um, and then we have somebody from Tory Griffith saying, would you think he was the funny version of Candyman? Absolutely not. I do not think he's a very funny version of Candyman because there is nothing funny about Candyman. And the reason why I say that is because I have a, I have a fear of Candyman because there was a guy that I, uh, when I growing up, there was a guy that used to live in this abandoned house. I don't think it was abandoned. I just think that we were told to not go over there. He lived in on a dead end street. The grass was about all the way to your stomach. Like he never cut the yard or anything like that. And there was a house back there. And he used to walk outside wearing that exact same fur coat all throughout the fucking year. And he would just be standing on his porch looking. And they always told us, do not go back there and mess with that man over there in that house. 
They was like, there was two people you didn't mess with. The dude at the dead end and Crazy Chris. We gonna get into Crazy Chris on another episode because that's a whole different story. But there was two people on my block that you didn't go mess with and it was those two. So there ain't nothing funny about Candyman. Um, and so, yeah. And so, um, from what I'm seeing in the Beetlejuice trailer, like we said, it looks like Astrid has been taken. And so now uh, Lydia Dietz, Winona Ryder, and Michael Keaton now, it seems like they have to pair up to go save Astrid. So Beetlejuice and Lydia Dietz are now pairing up to go save them. The person that tried to, you know, enslave her by marrying her is now having the team up to go save her daughter. And so uh, we also start to get to see um, a whole bunch of people new and stuff like that uh, in there. Of course, we have who uh, Monica Bellucci is also in it as one of the spirits. Her name is Dolores. We also see that William Defoe is going to be in it as Wolf Jackson. Uh, I'm not sure who that is uh, in there. Uh, Danny DeVito is in this movie and, and so many more. Um, uh, Burn Gorman is, is playing a pastor, Father Damon, and curse you don't know who Burn Gorman is. Um, if you saw the Dark Knight, he was the one that uh, the Dark Knight uh, rises, the one with Heath Ledger's Joker. He was the guy that was uh, almost trying to like get Catwoman shot, the assistant to the guy that was working with Bane. Um, phenomenal actor as well. Um, and it just it just looks like it's still going to be that Beetlejuice feel with a lot more action now in it. You know, the first Beetlejuice was very classy because it had um, it had that certain pace to it that kind of crept you out and kind of let you know about the dead. But since we know about it now, now it looks like we're kind of diving further deep into it. And we're starting to see more of not just the hierarchy of what it takes to transition from limbo to where you're going to be assigned, but now kind of the politics of these spirits that are still not at ease that want, that don't want to pass on. So, um, I think it's going to be worth the watch. Um, not sure if it's going to grab everybody for, uh, not sure if it's going to grab everybody. Um, ah, I don't know if you're not a Beetlejuice, if you're a Beetlejuice fan, you're going to go see it. If you're not, I'm not sure if it's going to initially grab you, if I'm just being honest. I'm a Beetlejuice fan, so I'm going to see it regardless. Like, I'm going to be like a fat kid at Christmas, just smiling ear to ear. Because uh, with Michael Keaton returning as Beetlejuice, I don't see you doing a bad job at portraying Beetlejuice. Um, and then shout out to uh, King of the Games deck uh, for joining us as well here on the live. Um, I... I I just don't know if it will draw in a new audience to want to see it. That's about that would be probably my only concern. Like I think people who are a fan of Je Jenna Ortega, her movies as well as the Scream franchise may come in to come see it. <sighs> but I'm just I don't know if it's gonna bring in a new audience. But it's definitely gonna bring all of us that's that is a, that's no Beetlejuice that aware that is aware of Beetlejuice. All of us are in. We've been hearing about a sequel for over a decade now. That they were supposed to be where they were gonna be on vacation at one point, where you know when Owen Ryder was still a little younger, um, and all kind of different type of theories as to how they could have a sequel. Um, but you know. We never really got a chance to see anything, and now we're getting it. And supposedly, we we might also be getting a third inst installment of the movie as well. Apparently, there is a third ver uh, uh, a, a third movie written out. Apparently, um, so we shall see. But all I know is I'm very excited for Beetlejuice to come out. Cannot wait for it to drop on. I believe it comes out September 9th. Uh, so it's a great movie for the fall. Uh, even if you don't know it as well for, you know, some, some of you millennials, go check it out on a Tuesday. Go check it out on a Tuesday afternoon. See it. See what we like about it. But for me, this is definitely that I don't mind paying $17 to go see it at night. I don't mind going to see it the Thursday before it gets ready to drop officially 
um, in theaters. So hopefully I definitely get a screening of it as well so I can see it a little bit early and I can come talk to y'all about it. Not getting nothing away, but talk to y'all about it. Um, and shout out to Laura uh, Aloha for still having her Beetlejuice action figure. I actually still have a Beetlejuice blanket back in my hometown as well. That's what lets you know, hey, I am a fan of the juice. <laughs> okay. And then more movie news. Uh, we also have found out that there is another film that is going to be getting another insta uh, installation. If you are a fan of the Knives Out franchise, come on, man. The Knives Out franchise, they we have gotten the announcement that a third movie will be coming out and we also got a title and an official release time uh the new title for this knives out third installment is going to be wake up dead man and of course uh, D uh daniel craig will be returning as our favorite uh mr blanc detective blanc he will be returning for the third film and it will be on netflix and it is scheduled to release in 2025 um now, I'm a huge Knives Out fan. Um, just for those that haven't seen Knives Out, if you've ever heard of the game Clue, uh, it, it's Clue. It's Clue. They've made Clue into a movie. And when you start to think about it, and it's just like, okay, I, I guess. Like, there they go taking, you know, board games and trying to make movies. This is how you take a board game like that and you make a movie. Not like how they did Battleship. Not that bullshit. But this is how you take a board game and you turn it into a fantastic movie. The first Knives Out movie, incredible. Cast, incredible. And even trying to figure out who did it. Still incredible twist and turns all the way to the very end. Then the sequel, uh, Glass Out, I'm, I'm sorry, not Glass Out, Glass Onion was released on Netflix as well as this third installment will be released on Netflix, Wake Up Dead Man. It will also be on there. It is a part of a um, $450 million uh, deal that was made for this and yes Big Mac 70 and King of the Games deck I do know Clue had an original film and just and thank you for reminding those that may not have known that that Clue was an original film but this is where they kind of take the spin off and I believe there's also a book with Knives Out where they kind of merge the two and if you watch Glass Onion they actually make fun of the fact that clue is always referenced as this being a live action clue in glass onion. Uh, Janelle Monet is also in the film. Also to the second film had an extraordinary cast. Um, uh, uh, detective Blanc hates clue. He hates board games. He's not great at board games. And so she says, you must be fantastic at clue. And he's just like, uh, just eye roll. Like he cannot stand it. And so it's just very funny to even see them laugh at it. So I'm very curious to see how Wake Up Dead Man is going to play out as the third installment to Knives Out. Um, outside of just Blanc, uh, Detective Blanc, the cast always seems to change. So I, I haven't really seen any connection between the two. So I don't know if they'll keep that same uh, that same aesthetic going. Or that same type of thing going where it's going to be a completely different uh, cast. And even so, I still look forward to see who will be cast in this third film as a group. Will it be, we've already seen now from a, a big family in the first one. We've seen now a group of friends as well. So I'm just curious to see what setting is going to be made for Detective Blanc to come into? Or will this be around the world of Detective Blanc? Will this now be something of his and maybe a bit personal when it comes to this third film? So not sure, but I am always so excited to see these. Um, I will say, just to be fair, that what I am hoping is, I'm hoping this one is a little harder to figure out, all right? If you've watched Knives Out um, and you've watched Glass Onion, I figured out Glass Onion very quick. Now, for Knives Out, I did not see that coming. Like, it was a lot of twists and turns in that one because 
a lot of stuff had to pivot based off of the person that they were sending her in around. So um, the uh, the actress Ana de Armas was the uh, nurse to this um, very wealthy book writer who winds up killing himself. And um, due to that, because of how she was and how her choices were throughout the movie, it pivoted how the real killer had to act because of the decision she was making with knives uh with glass onion glass onion was a little more easier to figure out just because of how they were setting things up and just how they tackled things but it was also because it was the man it was behind a man whose ego got him and like you know detective blanc said the guy's an idiot which he really was it was just an idiot shrouded around a whole bunch of wealth and it was kind of like a peacock like hey look at this why you don't go look at what i just did but i still kind of want you to look between the feathers to see that yo i did this and so i just hope like in wake up dead man we kind of get back to that first one where it's twist turns and it's kind of just like okay i don't know who did this i have no idea who did this so that's why i'm just hoping for the third one um, but I'm still excited, as always, to see a Knives Out mystery. I, I hope they continue them as well. Um, it's always such a fun show. I'm mean, show, not a show, a fun movie to watch. So, speaking of shows, as I, you know, tripped up on my words, we are going to start moving into television. We got a few season finales that popped up this week. Um, so, of course, Abbott Elementary finished off their season um, this past week. And it was, I got to say, I, I liked how this one ended. I love the pace of Abbott Elementary. I love that they stick to the whole school year type of feel where we go from the beginning of school and then we get ready for summer. And uh, in this episode, it was a lot. It was, you know, it's always focused on, of course, the staff. But this one was more focused on their personal lives. And um, in the season finale, again, I'm not going to give a whole bunch of spoilers. Well, I actually am. So if you haven't seen the season finale, um, go watch our previous ex uh, episode, which is X-Men Withdrawals. But in the uh, season finale, you know, we finally, finally, this man Gregory grows some nuts and goes and gets his little hobbit woman, Miss Teagues, after Miss Teagues throws a party at her house for the entire staff and a couple of friends that they bring on. Uh, and I loved it. I loved it. I enjoyed to finally see him step it up. I'm not bl I'm not blaming Janine because Janine finally said so she stepped up a while back and said something that she liked him and Gregory just in his head. And then you worried about you worried about this other dude that's at the superintendent office that smile way too fucking much and look like he's high all the time. Every time. This is how he be looking. Hey, what's up, baby? <laughs> how are how are you? How's it going, Janine? Yeah, well, we here at we here at the ISD, man. We just we just want to be able to make sure that we can help all of the students out and do something just a little bit better. How the fuck are you scared of him? How in the hell, what, yo? For the fact that his beard connected, you were scared to go after your woman. Listen, man. My beard and my mustache have been gang banging and segregated for damn near 10 years now. All right. I only got a few right here. They starting to try to make a little peace treaty so that we can finally come together in facial hair harmony. But this would never stop me from going after the chick that I wanted. Now, my man titties may slow me down, but my facial hair will never slow me down. And I was like, yo. This man, just like how King Mike Hall just said, the dude at the superintendent office never had a shot with Miss Teagues. And I hated that we had to wait the whole season for you to finally want to hook up with her. And then of all people y'all going to listen to on the field trip, you going to listen to the principal being like, oh, no, it's going to cause a whole bunch of trouble. Y'all not going to let. Hey, man, fuck them. Love is love. But I was glad to finally see it, man. And I also love the structure in which how they set everybody up this season. Um, have, having uh, the other teacher, I, I, uh, ah, what's his name? I, I keep wanting to call him Gregory. 
I know, and I know that's Eddie's last name and stuff like that. But for some reason, the white boy just looked like a Gregory to me. And I, 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 maybe I'm just the only one, but I'm like, yo, you look like a Gregory. And I was like, what, what's his what's his real name on here? Jacob, Jacob, uh, um, Jacob moving in with Miss Shaminti. I love that that happened this year. I thought that that was so cool of them to do. Uh, Ava, I love that, like how Ava is and uh, us being introduced to her sorority, her sister with the beautiful, oh, oh my goodness, just still beautiful Tatiana Ali. I was more, li listen here, listen here. Now, now Quinta, I love your show. I love your show. And I don't want, I don't want you to feel like I just jumped on the bandwagon. Well, let me say, y'all cook with that casting, man. Y'all was cooking with that cast, and when you cat, boy, when I saw Tatiana Ali on there, I'm like, oh, whoo, still looking good, still looking good, boy, whoo, still, man, make me want to have a kid just so I can go drop off at her school, be like, nah, I'm single, I wanted them single parents, be like, what's up? What is up? But I thought it was a dope cast, and I thought it was a great season, too. Uh, they tackled on a lot of different type of issues, a lot of stuff when it comes to kids and school and everything. Just a great season. So glad that they've been renewed for another one. Um, and I'm also in agreement with, uh, with King Mike Hall that – um, I would love to see them on their summer break activity. Not not the entire season, but give me a few episodes where we see like what happens with them and stuff. Uh, as well as uh, Tori Griffin's point, uh, love seeing Questlove. I, I do like that too. I will say that you are right with that. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I do like seeing when they had the feature with Questlove because it gave Ava some more, it made her more solid. It made it made you understand that there is a method to Ava's craziness and there's a method to her madness. And it actually showed you that Ava actually is a really great principal. She may not be a great traditional principal, but Ava is a great principal. She really shows you in this season how much she cares about this school. And how much she cares about this school progressing and becoming a better school for them. So I know we always kind of get, you know, like blindsided by her antics, but there's a lot that Ava does. And for her to be able to show like, yo, outside of the school, I really am about that life. And to have Questlove come and confirm one of her stories, I think made it just a little bit more of like, we already like her, but it also showed us that, hey, y'all are adding some depth and layers to her as to the reason why we see her like this. And it just keeps her more likable. And it keeps you wanting more from Ava as well. Same thing with... um. Um, Miss, uh, uh, of course, Miss Cheryl Lee Raff, the legend, uh, playing Barbara Howard. We got to see her, um, in all of her strides from having to adapt to the new age of parenting, having to adapt to the new age of education in the whole episode where she had to deal with the iPad and stuff like that. And just trying to be better as well, even as, um, uh, as the janitor, man, <laughs> Mr. Johnson, man, Mr. Johnson just, it, it, it is so dope and everything and, and, and whatnot. King Mike Hall, uh, no, no, no. Ava is not a horrible principal. Ava is not a horrible principal, and she's not more diabolic than Michael Scott. Michael Scott needed to be punched in the face several times. Ava just do a lot of stuff that ain't traditional. But Ava got a lot of stuff accomplished in that sense, because if you think about it, let, let's think about this last, this last couple episodes um, when Jacob wanted to get the field trip. Do you know how many times in like regular education they just tell them no or it, we don't have the money for it? But just as they said in the season finale, like, yo, encouraging your staff to do something. Do you know how many people, because of the fact that they don't have a budget, they don't necessarily try to get stuff situated? You have a lot of teachers, though, that will do what they can to do, like, you know, food can drives, other stuff to be able to get money for their kids to go on field trips. And I think Ava showed a great job at being able to motivate her student to motivate her uh teachers 
to be able to do things. We saw a lot of them have accomplishments as well, being able to do stuff. We saw a lot of highlights with Abbott this year. And even especially like with Miss T's going to the ISD, we wouldn't have gotten that if she had not been at Abbott and went through the stuff she went through, having uh, Barbara Howard, having Miss Shaminti as her mentors, and even the way Ava pushed her into things. Like, look at her dramatic change from how she wasn't so confident. And then also, though, picking up some of Ava's confidence in hanging out with her, in changing the way that she acts and the mood that she does. And look at the conversations now that she has with Ava. She's way more confident in how she speaks now. She says a lot of the stuff that she wants to say she says no when she doesn't feel like doing things you can't tell me that some of that does not stem uh stem excuse me from the personality that ava is and that is just another way of being able to motivate your teachers to come here and be happy same thing with Gre uh, uh with, with, with uh mr eddie as well and the garden there is a lot of stuff that we see in the background because of how she situates these things that you see these people flourish and everything. And yes, you do see some of the crazy stuff like King Mike Hall is saying um, when Ava got Janine blocked by Kevin Hart. But also, too, why would Kevin Hart be your daddy? That's why it's like, yo, that's so silly. But even, too, in the end, we got to see that Kevin Hart messed with Mr. Johnson. So who's to say that we don't get another Kevin Hart ca uh, cameo, but it just, it's so Janine that she got blocked by Kevin Hart and it's so Ava for the, uh, <laughs> that she's the one that did it. Okay. Um, and yes, again, Ava is not a traditional principal. And so, yes, there's some negligence where they have to uh, do these things, but then also too, as a principal, there's some things that you don't take as priority because these other things need to take priority over that because you may not be able to do anything about it and rather than just saying that you also have to let people experience that um and so and then too you also see ava get down with a lot of stuff like there was times when like ava didn't have a substitute teacher what did she do she taught a class she ain't fit to taught a, to teach a class but she got down in the gutter with them when it was needed when they had the whole apocalypse episode where they were just like showing like yo she's really about this structured life if if a, uh if a crisis was to hit yo they really showed us this season how much intelligence and there is a method to Ava's madness. And I just really applaud them on that. I applaud them on this season, especially with the writer strike that happened. Um, and people, you know, weren't sure of the fate of a lot of TV shows, but for them to get another season and for them to come back um, strong in this season, I thought was really good to see. So I appreciate uh, seeing such a great season finale and I can't wait for them to come out again and give us that same hilarity. But uh, I will say too, again, the King Michael's Hall point, I do want to see some summer activities this time. So hopefully maybe one or two episodes before school starts and we get to see that. Now, another one that we uh, also had that was not a season finale, but uh, actually a series finale. Grownish, Grownish, uh, aired its final episode this week on Freeform. Um, the show lasted six seasons and it showed us the transition of Zoe's character going to college, also going off into the real world and then transitioning to her brother. Also now attending the same college and going through the trials and tribulations of being in college. Uh, shout out to the official storm. No problem that you haven't been here. Life happens, but we're glad to have you here today. Hope you got you some nice food, breakfast food or some lunch, depending on where you're at in the world. And thank you for joining us for another episode. We just getting into it. Um series finale aired again if you haven't seen it this is a spoiler so um if you do want to see it and you don't want to know about the spoilers once again you can go check out our past episode watch uh x-men withdrawals or go watch uh the best 90s uh cartoons uh top oh excuse me oh sorry about that um <laughs> it is early here uh, but yes, uh, to Tori Griffin's point, uh, I also believe that I thought that season five was the last season. And I believe that it actually was. I believe that they actually did say five was going to be the last one. 
Um, <laughs> Laura Aloha says it's 636 a.m. here. First of all, I appreciate you being up watching me then. I, I, I am going to try not to yawn as much, but I, I probably am. I'm not even gonna, <laughs> I'm not even gonna give myself that challenge. I most likely am, but I am glad you're up watching us just along with everybody else. Um, and, uh, you know, and I understand too, like a lot of people, like official storm say, you know, I stopped watching when the sister graduated. Um, and what's going on, Granddaddy Perp? Thank you for joining us. Uh, I I didn't because I like the character that was Junior, and I did want to see him evolve and want to see what his character was going to be like. And I think they did a very fantastic job of creating a ensemble cast for Andre. Um, if you were a millennial, I think this was a great thing for a millennial to see a lot of dialogue that was used in there comes from the new generation, but it also still, you know, you have those things that, you know, for someone like myself that can see that can understand it and was like, okay, you know, you, I, I see what y'all doing. I see where you're going. So I thought that was cool to see. And, um, yeah, it was the last episode final episode of grownish and i got and i'm and i'm not, and i'm gonna be honest with you uh when i watch grownish not not just grownish um when i watch a show that you know you've been you've you've dedicated to and see it's always kind of hard it's hard to say goodbye to him it is it's really hard to say goodbye to him and um this one was no different um ah and i appreciate that king mike hall that uh that this this is helping with your work day um this one was hard this one was also hard to say goodbye to um and they set it up very well like andre graduated um and it is a blackish spin it is a spinoff of blackish uh granddaddy perp but um it was dope we got to see andre graduate we got to see him now going into the real world with a job um that landed him into a little predicament for this last one where he wound up throwing a yacht party graduation type thing for a yacht that was going to be sold by one of his clients. Um, and I just thought it was good to see how they pieced everything together. Finally getting to see uh, Zoe and Aaron finally decide what the fuck they're going to do. And they wound up getting married and getting married on that actual boat. They didn't wait, didn't hesitate. They got married right then and there. It was good to see the blend of the first cast that was along with Zoe as well, come together with the new school, seeing them interact with one another and even giving them some of like some very good real world advice. So, you know, like, especially for those that's been in college or even for those that's, that, you know, we've all been in high school, of course, um, giving us that, you know, real, that realism that, you know, in college, you see these people every day, but in the real world, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to keep up with these friendships. And it really had me thinking about, you know, like when I graduated art school, like how many people that I interacted with on a day to day basis that I barely talk to now. And I was just like, wow, like they write. It's like it is kind of difficult. Um and you have to have more of an effort to keep them in there. But also, too, um, what it made me realize was there's a lot of cats that I know that we haven't spoken in years. But when we do, it's like we didn't miss a beat. We're still it's like it felt like we were still in those apartment uh, that they tried to say were a dorm room. So we were in an actual apartment complex. It still has that same feeling. And so for me, it was just like, wow, it was really cool to see that. Um, now, I will say, I will say, so I did have my gripes about it. And it's not a lot of them for the series finale, but I kind of wish that there were some things that they would have done. And I understand why they didn't do it, because during the time, again, I don't think that there was a renewal for season six. Then there became a renewal for season six. They got halfway into it. Then it stopped. And supposedly that they had canceled the show. Um, then the writer strike hit. But then all of a sudden it was like, OK, we'll do it. But this will be the final season. So we weren't even sure if we were going to get a finale episode when season six started. They also it was a rumors that when it got to the middle, like they weren't going to renew it. But 
we lucked out. We were able to get it all the way through. They were also able to get 100 episodes, which I thought was great because then that means they're now in syndication, which is great, especially for this whole Blackish universe to have two shows, Blackish and Grownish, exceed over 100 episodes and get to be in syndication. And for those that don't know, that's a very big deal to be put into syndication. Syndication of uh, for the millennials is for cable television. So when there's a show that comes out um, during, uh, you know, like cable television run syndication, you had the only way to get syndication is basically where they will replay your show on different things. So kind of look at it like streaming. When you go to like Max, Hulu or Netflix, people will license out a movie or a television show to be shown onto their platform. So that's technically what syndication was um, for television. If it reached over a hundred episodes, people would license it to be put onto their channel. So that's why you see something like, uh, for instance, in the chat, Fresh Prince be on um, Nickelodeon, also on the WB, or seeing it on UPN because it was able to hit syndication and it's allowed to be on other people's networks rather than just the network that uh, created the show. But in order to do that, reaching syndication, you had to have more than 100. You had to reach 100 episodes. And um, that's what they did for a lot of black television during the 90s and close to the... Um, in the 2000s and stuff, which was kind of a double edged sword, too, because um, for a lot of black shows, the production company was only concerned with the show getting to 100 episodes, not necessarily the story. So, for instance, I'll give you a prime example, like the Jamie Foxx show. The Jamie Foxx show got close to 100 episodes, and when it did, they ended the series. But if you remember the Jamie Foxx show, the last season was very sped up. Like it kind of really sped up the whole Jamie getting married to fancy, the whole thing of what was going to happen with the hotel junior and, uh, and, um, and um, the wife retiring and everything like that. It was very sped up. They it, it kind of felt like rushed within the last five episodes, but they only had five more where they had to get everything out. So that's why I said like, sometimes it's a double edged sword for them. Um, when it comes to those things, but for this one, it helps Grownish be able to be shown outside of just streaming, like on Freeform, uh, which is you know re now current, well, which formerly was ABC Family, um, is now Freeform. But it'll be able to be shown on different platforms, with on cable television, and now on different streaming platforms. So that's really what syndication is, and so I was glad that they got that. Now my gripe about Grownish was. I didn't like that there were a few people that weren't shown. And now I will, I, I, I will, I will say just to be fair that because of the writer strike and everything that was going on scheduling and all of that stuff, I understood why, but I still just didn't like it. I didn't like the fact that um, their parents weren't on this last episode. I, I didn't like that we didn't have a scene where Bo congratulates Junior on graduating. As big as they are on education, I would have loved to see some kind of cameo with the parents. I didn't need the entire family or anything like that. Like, I'm cool that the twins weren't shown or anything like that. But, like, to not have the parents be shown on here was kind of like, okay. And then the same thing even with, like, Zoe getting married. It's like, yo, like, I, like... Andre, if you've watched Blackish, Andre is very connected with Zoe. So not walking Zoe down the aisle for her wedding, I was just like, um, it kind of tainted the episode a little bit for me. As you can tell, it was like, again, it's kind of that double edged sword thing. Like it's coming to an end. So we got to kind of rush this thing. Like, but to have neither of the parents there for their son's graduation and their daughter's wedding just says a lot. Even too, to the point where, again, if you could not book them, it would have been funny to see a little thing of uh, Zoe or, or, or even Junior like FaceTiming their, their dad. And it's like, you did what? And then they hang up. 
and stuff like something i i would have like like i would have loved to have seen something like that or even to the point where zoe's ensemble cast majority of them turn return except chloe and bailey i would have liked to seen at least one of them in it but i understand that they are international superstars so i know scheduling probably would have been a little bit difficult but that was really my only gripe about the ending i just was just like I, I would have liked to have seen them in this final series finale just because of how well the show did. Six seasons is a lot, especially within this time. Um, um, and I would have loved to seen it all come full circle or at least even a phone call from the grandparents. You can even have them like in a separate scene where they're not together. Just had them meet up in LA shot a scene where they're on the phone where they're like, Hey, congratulations and stuff like that. Junior, I need $3,000 for something. <laughs> Help your granddad out something. But it was like, yo, they didn't even, they didn't even highlight the original family. So it was just kind of like, that was the only thing that I just didn't like about it. But everything else, I'm just like, okay, I understand. But I don't like it when these type of things are rushed like that. And like I said, I think it's always a double-edged sword for black sitcoms when it comes to these endings. Because even in a different world, we got a very confusing ending. You know what I'm saying? Like it didn't even really necessarily end like and I and again, I need to go look this up, but it was the way in the order in which it was like the last episode shouldn't have been the last episode. The last episode should have been Dwayne Wayne and um, Whitley going to Japan and moving on to the next phase and that wasn't the last episode. The last episode was the new kids and they went on to like this little camping thing that like to this house, this cottage that Billy D owned Billy D Williams owned. And then those were the last final episodes. And I was just like, wait a minute. So was it a continuation or did this get canceled? And same thing, yeah, like with that so Raven, like it was a few of these where it's just like, dang, um, I wasn't sure like how those were supposed to end and stuff like that. But at least like I say, we we lucked out to where Gronish got an ending. And I know there's a few of them where that doesn't necessarily happen. Like, for instance, the Wayans Brothers show. The Wayans Brothers show um, is another prime example of the double-edged sword of syndication because they got to 100 episodes and then they stopped the show. The last episode was where uh, Marlon and Sean had stolen Roy Jones Jr.'s boxing gloves. And that was the final episode. Like, that was it. Like, there was no no closure, no nothing. That was just the final episode. So, like, we don't know if Sean remained doing the newsstand. What? We don't know what happened. There were no, like, what is now going to happen to these characters? Did Marlon keep acting? Did he get a big acting role where it's like, okay, now he's got, he's got to go to Hollywood and everything? So I'm not sure. And Official Storm, I don't know it for the different world thing. I don't know if that was the final episode. I just know when you watch it on syndication, that's how they play it. Every time when they're doing like the marathons or they're doing like where they'll play it and then they'll restart from the first season, they show those episodes last. The one where Dwayne and Whitley go to Japan, that's always the either the third or the fourth episode before and they'll show those right after. So it's like, not really sure. And uh, Granddaddy Perp, I will say, um, I can answer, I can actually answer those. Uh, for the Boondocks um, and Black Jesus, they kind of work coincide with one another as why we won't get another one. Um, actually, you know, our resident, uh, um, uh, I guess, you know, straight out of comic booker, I guess, if that's what we'll start calling them, our guests. But uh, Young Deuce was actually one of the first ones on his podcast, uh, the Geek Set podcast, uh, was the first one to actually uh, get wind of that they will not be bringing back the boondocks. Um, for the big reasons that John Witherspoon is no longer here. Um, they just don't feel right casting anyone else to talk his grandpa or to continue the story without him. It just doesn't seem right because of grandpa being such a 
big uh, piece of that show. Same thing for Black Jesus. Um, with the passing of Charlie Murphy and John Witherspoon, they just didn't feel it right to continue another season without those two because they are such pivotal roles within both of those series. And so they just didn't feel that it was right to go on. Um, and so, yeah. So, but, but again, too, very glad to see that, um, they got the chance to end their story with Grownish. Like I said, that's just a really small piece of what I wish I would have saw in it. But nonetheless, they did end it off very well. Glad to see Zoe being successful as well as Andre Jr. going on to be successful as well. Um, and so a couple of things that y'all are even saying in the chat, uh, I believe that's the re that's part of the reason why we don't get another Friday movie. Uh, Official Storm, actually, no. The reason why we have not gotten a Friday movie is because the folks at Warner Brothers, because I believe it was owned by New Line Cinema, and then Warner Brothers bought New Line Cinema, they will not agree they to the writing that um, Ice Cube has made for the film. So there's this battle between them of trying to, you know how like companies get, they want to put their input in and they want to change these things. They want to change that stuff. They want this to happen. And so they're not necessarily looking at what made the movies great, but like how we can feel as many people in the seats. And it's just so they've just been battling back and forth about how that wants to be done. And just, you know, again, like Ice Cube is not budging. Ice Cube wants this a certain way. He wants this made in a certain way, which I believe is the way that we want to see it. And they're trying to give him coming to America, too. If you saw coming to America, too, you know exactly what I mean when I refer to that. And I don't think Ice Cube wants that to happen so that's the reason why we have not gotten another friday because even chris tucker has came out and said that if he does he wants to do it to where they have children and he wants dc young fly to play his son and it would still be around this time where that could happen it's been enough time to pass to where it the torch could be passed to where you have o'shea jr and dc young fly be their kids and it centers around them you can even pay homage to john witherspoon in either keeping him alive and just not on screen or you can also say that he passed away and put in that passing and if and even so that starts the movie you can see them two there and then it switches to the kids and it's just like, dang. So this is what happens on a Friday or it happens on Thursday, which leads into Friday. And so in Friday, you're seeing all this stuff, seeing Craig have to come back, deal with all of this stuff and packing up the house. They're packing up the house. That's what's happening on a Friday. This Friday, they're packing up the house, saying goodbye, going through the neighborhood and getting to some kind of shenanigan. Um, and to your point, uh, King Mike called, they're trying on YouTube, they're trying to gingerfy Friday and he just doesn't want that to happen. He just doesn't want that to happen. So that's the reason why we haven't gotten one just yet, but, um, I'm sure that eventually we will figure this out and we will get a third installment for Friday. And I, and just, I'm hoping that they allow it for it to be done right. Um, and everything. And yes, to your point, Official Storm, they probably are just trying to do mad celebrities and influencers for the new age. And that's just not what we want. Allow Ice Cube to tell his story the way he's been telling it. We look, I'm sorry, the fourth installment. I'm so sorry. Fourth installment of Friday. I don't know why I said third. The fourth installment of Friday. We just, yo, we just don't need it to be gendrified for millennials and you know i'm not shitting on millennials or anything like that but it's like yo i don't need a whole bunch of celebrities in here try to squeeze that in as much as you can no no keep it like how they kept it okay we had maybe one or two people in there that was major and the rest of these were the homies let it still be that you do not need to make it this big extravagant thing um so yeah but once again, shout out to Gronish for being able to have six seasons, past 100 episodes, and really lay out a great, great 
television series for millennials, for college kids. Like I say, you know, like for us, we believe this is the millennials. Blackish is their Cosby show. Grownish would have been their different world. And I'm just really glad to see them go out on top. You know what I'm saying? Nothing to where it got stale, it got old or anything like that. Not even trying to really say that about the Cosby show. But that is this generation's Cosby's. Even if, you know, you know, unfortunately, the everything going on behind Cosby and what has happened with him, at least being able to see like another generation have a reboot of that was very fulfilling to see. Now. We got to get into something that was uh, brought up to me. Moving away from, sort of moving away from, um, no, we're still in television, still in television. Um, somebody asked me something, and at first I was about to say that this is a stupid question, but then when I thought about it, I was like, I see why this this prompted up. And my, uh, someone asked me the DMs. Uh, they wanted to know who I thought would win in a fight between the cast of Invincible and the 97 X-Men. Now, before we go, this is a dumb question. Before, because believe me, when I was asked this, who would win between X Men '97 and Invincible? I too thought this was a dumbass question, but it is not particularly a dumbass question because this is not a bad lineup. This is not a bad lineup, and then two, there wasn't a lot of parameters given for this. So if we're going. The cast of this show versus the cast of the other show. And, I, and I'm sticking with X-Men 97, the cartoon show, versus Invincible, the cartoon show. No comics, no nothing. We're sticking with just the cartoon animated series. Not gonna lie. Invincible might take this. Invincible might take this win. And so here and here's the reason why I say that. Um one with Invincible, you have the Guardians and you got a lot of them. You have a lot of them. X-Men does too. And so that was the reason why I was like um I don't want to initially go off of this just yet. And see here's and here's the thing King Mike Hall, Wanda is not in the X-Men. So that's another thing. Wanda is not in the X-Men. In X-Men 97. She's not in the X-Men. She is a part of the series, but she is not officially a X-Men just yet. Um So if we're going off of the mains, I want to stick with just the mains cuz I don't want cuz if we if we start going into all the folks that are not like if we go start going into the tertiary heroes and stuff like that, we're going to be here all day. But now, if we're going mains versus mains, Invincible might take this. And the only reason why I say that is because, one, you have three, basically, you have three Supermans. You got Invincible, you got Omni-Man, and then you got the other one, you got Immortus. I mean, Immortal, whatever his name, the one that's Immortal, uh, that they keep bringing back. I always forget his name. Um, But you have him as well. That's a lot. And the only one you really got strong wise for that is rogue. That's a lot. And she, and they can fly. That's a lot to deal with. And then two, you have two robots. So you have, you have, uh, the, you have the robot and you also have him now as a child. So that's also a lot <laughs> to take. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I really tried to keep this up. I really, I, I really tried to keep this going. I did. I really tried to keep this going. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I really wanted to make it seem like they had a chance. <laughs> but you're fucking crazy if you think Invincible can beat the X-Men. You are crazy if you think Invincible's 
can beat X Men. I'm I'm so sorry if you really think that. First of all, Storm alone could destroy all of them in one sitting. Like, let's really break this down when we look at it. Let's really break this down when we look at this. So, we got the girl that turns into a monster. Doesn't have any full out superhero strength. Let's pit let's pit her against Beast. Beast will kick her ass. Don't let Beast don't do not let Beast intelligence fool you. Beast got fucking hands. So that takes care of her. Duplicate. Cyclops will, will annihilate Duplicate. Because Duplicate can only multiply. She doesn't have strength. And then two, the biggest thing that they have that's in their pocket is you have three Omega level mutants. Two of them are in control of the mind. So that's the other thing that happened. So Charles literally can make Immortal have PTSD and turn on all of them. Especially if Charles was evil. And now you also have Magneto, who's technically an X-Men now. Magneto, robot, out of there, done. Completely finished. So now you got Adam, Eve, Adam. And here, and here's the thing about that is, outside of Immortal, a majority of these people can be killed instantly. So can Invincible. Invincible isn't technically invincible because he can die. And that's the thing that is like, that's the thing that really pits them against that. If they had the rapid ability healing of Wolverine, this may have been a battle. And the thing is, um, and the thing is, if, if Omni-Man is there, again, because you have X-Men, you still have Magneto and Charles. If those two fuse together, they become Onslaught. Omni Man is not fucking with Onslaught. Ever. Immortal, Invincible, Omni Man, none of them could fuck with Onslaught. Even Alan. Even Alan, who got powerful as a Viltrumite. Could not do that shit. Could not do that shit. And here's the thing. If you told me Adam, e if Adam Eve was older, if Adam Eve was older, I would say she could potentially put up a fight. But the, another person that could take her on would be, uh, would be Cable and Bishop. And he still got Forge. You still got Forge, you still got Iceman, you still got Shadow Cat, you still got Colossus. You still have not just the people that you see right here, and you have Morph, and Morph takes on everyone's powers. Sort of. But that that is you have way too many aces in the holes. And they have they have more art. I, I say X-Men has more artillery than the folks in Invincible. Like your big guns is Omni Man, Immortal, Adam Eve, Invincible. Those are your big guns. X Men's big guns: Charles Xavier, Magneto, Storm, Jean Grey. I didn't even mention Rogue. And Rogue can steal powers, and she can also. Take on your shit, even turn, and then Charles can turn a more immortal against everybody. So that's what I'm saying. Like I like when I see Invincible when he's fighting, he just reminds me of Rogue. Like you can still take this L though. And again, and again, to even Tory Griffiths part, we're not even gonna mention Charles' son. We're not even getting to X Force yet. We just getting to the people that's in X Men '97. And then two, none of them have a leader like and Invincible does not have a leader like Cyclops. You have a you have several strategic minds that are smart as fuck. And I didn't even mention Gambit. I didn't even mention Gambit, who at the touch could fuck everybody up. Now, if this was maybe like uh to, to um Big Beck 70 over on Twitch to say if this was the Justice League, this may be different. Nightcrawler. We ain't even mentioned Nightcrawler. That's again, that's why I'm just like, I, I, I wanted 
to, to, to really come from the invincible side first and talk my talk. But unfortunately, Invincible has a dope crew that I just don't think they're big guns or pow- powerful enough yet. Because what the fuck is Rexplosion going to do against Jubilee? Rex has items. This shit come like you do explosions like that. This shit comes out of her. Rexplosion is not going to fuck with Gambit whatsoever. Even the Martian that they have on Invincible, Omni-Man showed how to fuck him up. So that's not going to be hard for X-Men to figure out. You got what the shrinking girl as soon and yo know, as soon as that happens, it's over. Because all of them don't have a super strength. They're not built that way. They're built based off of their powers, but that's really it. So that's why I say you only really got four big guns compared to eight cannons that they ain't even got to put in the forefront just yet. You know what I'm saying? So I just, I, so when it comes to these two, although I get it, Although I get it. I understand. I understand completely what people, you know, because Invincible is a great show. It's a good show. But with the history X-Men have, I don't believe, and, and not, not, even, not even the history, the experience that they have, this is a better group. And that's what will really seal in Invincible. They're not a great team. It's a team of assholes that have came together that have too many egos on that team for them to be able to defeat the X-Men. The X-Men is a family. You saw in the show how many combos this team put together with two, three of them. When they all came together, how they can kick ass. Invincible's team has never shown that. It's always a group of, they're like the Avengers. They sometimes come, well, more like the Justice League, not the Avengers, more like the Justice League. They're all there and they kind of do their thing. And then when it's time to come together, that's when it's like, okay, hey, we need a plan. X-Men already got three plans. They already got this structure before they even came fought, y'all. So that's why I say experience would beat out the group of Invincible. And that's my choice. I try to give it to Invincible, but no. I just can't do it. It's just, it, it's not there. It's not there. Um, with a little bit more experience in the field, then maybe, just maybe, we may have a conversation. But as of right now, with the team that they have on Invincible versus the X Men 97 team, they getting washed. They getting washed. They getting dragged around this motherfucker like nobody's business. So that's just me for that. Um, but we are going to get into our final topic today, um, which I just, again, I, I, I have to address. Um, there's been a video circulating and, and, and I'm going to play the video because I want to address this. It is called the finding Nemo theory. So I'm going to go ahead and play this for y'all and I want y'all to check this out. Coral, you dirty bitch. Here I am on my lunch break thinking about how if Nemo mama would have survived, he would have never gotten lost and that his daddy was just so irresponsible. Come to find out. Barracudas don't even eat clownfish eggs, nor do they eat clownfish. But you know what animal does eat clownfish eggs? Clownfish. Here I am Googling finding Nemo mama name so I can refer to your tacky ass formally. And I find finding Nemo mom theory. I said, what the hell is the mom theory? So apparently after Finding Nemo came out, marine biologists were like, nah, barracudas don't eat clownfish, but female clownfish will eat their eggs, absolutely. Which then led to everybody asking, well, if she ate all the eggs, then why was Marlon looking for Nemo? Same question I had. To which somebody responds, because he was hallucinating and grieving and he went through all five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and acceptance. But this is what sealed that it might've been a hallucination for me. The Latin translation of Nemo is nobody. So the movie's name is Finding Nobody. I cannot believe I got to go to a meeting after that. I'm shook. Bitch, if I had a wig, it'd be on the floor. See? Here's 
here's my problem with this. Here's my problem with this. And, 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 and you know what? A lot of people, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Yes, a lot of the stuff that she said was true. And I would also say to myself, like, yo, that will really mess my head up. Like, I see a lot of y'all in the comments. And, you know, and we did look it up for Nemo. That is a translation for nobody. And it is true about the clownfish uh, stuff. But here is where I got to bust the hole in this dumbass theory. So... If what they're saying of this is a hallucination based off of the father going through the five stages of grief, right? Looking for his son, never finding his son. If that be the case, how the fuck did this scene happen? How, how the fuck did this scene happen right here? Whose POV is this scene from where Nemo meets the fish in the dentist's office? Because remember, he met those fish before Nemo's dad came up. So whose point of view are we seeing in this hallucination? You mean to tell me there's a hallucination of the, the, the chick, the little girl with the braces tapping on the fish and Nemo playing dead? So it was a hallucination when the doctor picked up a scoop of, I guess, empty water to go throw in the trash because apparently it's a hallucination. A whole hallucination where the father was not even at the dentist's office. So how can this be a part of the five stages of grief and a hallucination of an entire scene that the that the, the, the father doesn't even be at, wasn't even around, and had to eventually get over there by following his son? So what? Every, oh, so everybody hallucinating a fish's grief that he lost his little baby in an ocean full of fucking fish? The only thing that was really hallucinating was that that shark didn't eat that damn fish when he went up to him. Now, look, I like a good childhood cartoon theory as the next one. But sometimes, man, we just get, we just got to use some common sense, man. This is that same theory like when they said all the Rugrats are a figment of Angelica's imagination and all of them represent like a different thing of like death. Like Tommy was stillborn. Um, Chucky died in an accident with his mom. Um, and then like Phil and Lil died in the womb. So they never knew if it was a boy or a girl. So they just made a boy and a girl. I was like, if that's the case, who, who was the grandpa babysitting? Why was Spike playing with them so dogs see ghosts now that's what we doing dogs just playing around with angelica's figment of imagination he know how to ride like ride have figments of imagination on his back and walking around while angelica wasn't there so 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 you telling me Susie mama imagining stuff too and babysitting kids at Susie's house that ain't even there Come on now, like I said, I love a good childhood theory as much as the rest of them. But come on now. The fact that y'all saying that Nemo's dad hallucinated all of this, a whole dentist scene that he never was a part of. Okay. Okay, so I, if if that's what you want to believe, if that's what you choose to believe, okay, okay, if that's what if that's what we're doing, and Tori Griffith, to your point, if dogs can see ghosts, I'll give you that. That's fine. But again, they said they were a figment of Angelica's imagination. How is he seeing these these children when she ain't there? Because there were episodes where Angelica wasn't there and Spike interacted with these kids. So how does that happen? And same thing now to Shawnee uh, uh, 869. Dory found Nemo by himself. So was she hallucinating? 
Did she just and again and again too? I'll e- I'll even give you a, I'll even give you something to that point because again it would be how would she know what he looked like? Now he could have gave a description because if you look like it, it just looks like his dad smaller and as he mentioned a little fin. So I could see Dory picking up on that and thinking that she ran into him. But this whole dentist scene, nah, nah. You can't get you not gonna sit here tell me the sky is purple and I'm looking at it and it's blue. Like I said, Shawnee, I'll give them that part of Dory finding it and it being a hallucination. I'll give them that because I could see that happening with Dory. But sometimes we got to. Sometimes we got to use the common sense up here. I know common sense is a dying art form like opera, but we need a resurgence immediately. OK, we need us and uh, 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 we need us one. So I just had to get on that theory and I'm going to be clipping this to put out uh, because I just think that shit is stupid. And I was just like, so you're not finna sit here and just tell me, no, nah, man, it was just all ha- a hallucination. N- man, fuck you. That's how I feel about that. Fuck you if you think that's a hallucination. Oh, my goodness, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, to Granddaddy Perp's point, can we just enjoy the movie as is i will say it again can we just enjoy the movie as is okay (laughs) and i know people will not will not like this part but as i said with common sense uh and i'm going to say what uh shanae 869 said on twitch make common sense great again all right but um, ladies and gentlemen, that has been another episode of Straight Out of a Comic Book. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Appreciate everybody that watched on all of our channels that we got going on right now. I believe we only uh uh we, we got we had a, quite a few people in here today, and I really do appreciate that. I'm glad that y'all enjoy the uh, Strat of a Comic Book. Still trying to get it going with the uh, with the gaming and stuff like that, but we're gonna keep it building either way. So I just want to thank everyone for checking it out today make sure that you like and subscribe to the video the full video will be coming out in a couple of hours don't like to keep the live up i want to you know make sure it fits just well and we get the audio version going and then another announcement as well pertaining to strat of a comic book we have now we are going to be moving it to its official YouTube channel. So there is a Stride of a Comic Book YouTube channel. Make sure you go subscribe to that. We have an Instagram as well. Um, so I want y'all also to go follow that. If you are not following Stride of a Comic Book already, go follow it on the Instagram. It's no joke. It's out there in them streets right now. As you can see, we are out there. Stride of a Comic Book is on Instagram as well as Facebook. Facebook.com slash Stride of a Comic Book. We will be bringing you more of this series, man. I am very jumping into it, take, hitting the ground running, not overthinking it. Uh, uh, you know, like we talked about with the whole going solo stuff. So we are really expanding it out. And making this into the great the greatness that y'all have been seeing ever since it started and how much y'all believed in it. So because of y'all, thank you so much. So the YouTube channel is coming. The website is coming. Merch is coming. The Facebook and the Instagram is there. And we will also be getting a TikTok and Thread account also coming up uh, within, these, uh, w- uh, within the summer. Um, August, we will move into the show fully being there on YouTube. We'll still go live on these platforms, but you'll see the full episodes only on the straight out of a comic book YouTube starting in August. We will put some of the, uh, some clips, some, uh, little short versions of it on my channel onto the RK tokens channel, but we will be having it fully living on its YouTube channel page. And not only that. For this show, we will be expanding the show. We will be having the WTF movie reviews. We will take old movies, some current movies, and we are going to talk about some of the good, the bad, and the what the F when it comes to some of our favorite movies, along with other stuff going on in pop culture. As I said, the straight out of a comic book universe is expanding, and it is all thanks to each and every single one of you that check out this show, that comment on it, that say that they love it, um 
And yes, thank you for those that did check out the NXT stream that I have for my uh, NXT Rising for the Goliath. Um, I will be trying to do that pretty much damn near every day. So you never, uh, I'm going to start trying to organize a little bit more to announce when it's coming. So y'all have a chance to come check it out. Uh, but as I said, this is about to get a lot bigger, a lot more structured. Going to be doing interviews, going to be doing more phantom casting when it comes to Stride of a Comic Book. So thank you all that pulled up today for checking this out. As I said, um, I hope y'all have a wonderful weekend. Happy Memorial Day. I hope y'all are all going to be enjoying the four day weekend. Get you some barbecue. Do something great for yourself this weekend. All right. You deserve it. You have earned it. Treat yourself. It's a self-care weekend. Enjoy yourself and be safe out there. No matter where you are in the world right now, be safe out there. Don't let nobody's energy change and alter who you are. I've been your host, Will Farrow, and I am thoroughly glad to uh, be here with y'all. And I hope y'all have a tremendous weekend, and I will catch y'all next time. Peace out. Man, you come straight out of a comic.